So I'm now handing over to my other co-chairman, uh, John Stratakis, or Paul Stublin, Stratakis, and Gonzalez, uh, to introduce the other panels. John? Thank you. Our first panel of the day will focus on the hot topic of environmental challenges and opportunities in shipping. The moderator, appropriately, is my friend and co-chair, Ole Christian Schroeder, the Director of Environmental Compliance for Scorpio Group. Panelists are Jan Hagen Anderson, Business Development Director of DNV Maritime, Morton Skedsmo, Senior Vice President and Commercial Lead of Zero Lab, Nick Makar, Senior Vice President for Maritime Administration at International Registries, the Marshall Islands Registry, and Charlie Papavizas, a partner at the esteemed law firm of Winston Strawn in Washington, D.C. Our first panel of the day will focus on the hot topic of environmental challenges and opportunities in shipping. The moderator, appropriately, is my friend and co-chair, Ole Christian Schroeder, the Director of Environmental Compliance for Scorpio Group. Panelists are Jan Hagen Anderson, Business Development Director of DNV Maritime, Morton Skedsmo, Senior Vice President and Commercial Lead of Zero Lab, Nick Makar, Senior Vice President for Maritime Administration at International Registries, the Marshall Islands Registry, and Charlie Papavizas, a partner at the esteemed law firm of Winston Strawn in Washington, D.C. Good morning, everybody. And as previously stated, my name is Oli Schroeder from um, the Scorpio Group. And I'm pleased to have together with me today um, uh, quite an interesting panel uh, with various views on the um, many challenges we see in the environmental area and also opportunities. Uh, we are today more as ever faced with a lot of pressure on this industry to come up with new and effective measures to uh, implement and to uh, combat new rules and regulation that is facing us from various um, authorities and regulatory environments. There's a lot of discussions on the IMO and what IMO can achieve to move the industry in the right directions, but will they succeed in meeting this expectation? At the same time, I have to say that the industry, we don't take enough credit for what's being done. Um, we're painted in the media as a very slow moving industry, not taking a lot of initiatives, letting us being led by regulatory forces and just complying. But I have to say that we are doing a lot today that we don't get this credit for. We have many players uh, doing a lot of research. Um, we um, trying to develop various aspects of complying. And um, all together, all the stakeholders are trying to move forward in the right direction to meet the various emission standards uh, we're supposed to meet. New technology is being developed, and um, some companies are testing many uh, alternatives. And uh, we will discuss many of these aspects during our debate today. Starting us off today is uh, I'm going to introduce Nick Makar of the uh, is a senior uh, vice president of the Marshall Island Registry. He has in-depth knowledge of IMO, so I think it's prudent to have him kick off uh, this morning session. Uh, and tell us a little bit what IMO is doing. Thank you. Okay, Th thank you, Ole, and uh, great to see everybody virtually. Um, we're certainly looking forward to an in-face meeting, but uh, clearly um, we're not quite there yet. Um, you know, giving a little thought to your introduction, I think maybe it might be helpful to have some context of what the IMO or the International Maritime Organization actually is. Um, in case those aren't aware, it is a specialized agency of the nations. And its main responsibility is essentially looking after global standards to preserve the and maintain the safety, security, and environmental performance of international shipping. The IMO itself as an organization and its, its secretariat is really a facilitator in the development of those standards. The organization itself doesn't actually directly regulate shipping per se, but rather it 
is uh, it develops standards, which are then um, implemented and adopted by its member states. And at the moment, the uh, IMO is currently comprised of 175 member states that have interests in international shipping and uh, the maritime sector as a whole. The IMO itself is also um, interesting to point out that it is a technical organization as well, so that the development of the standards rely not only on the input from the member state representatives, but also on the vast technical expertise of various um, intergovernmental organizations and non-governmental organizations or NGOs that rep represent specialized areas of the sector. Ultimately, the main role of the IMO is creating this regulatory framework for international shipping industry that's fair, effective, and I'm borrowing from their website, universally adopted and universally implemented. Shipping can only operate effectively if regulations and standards are themselves agreed, adopted, and implemented on an international basis. So for that reason, the various international regulations um, that are developed at the IMO um, embody a couple of features which sort of help facilitate this, this concept of a level playing field and having it become equally applicable. Um, the first is that most international conventions uh, utilize a provision or the, the principle, I should say, of no more favorable treatment or what's also referred to as a non-discriminatory principle. What that basically means is that parties to a convention or member states that sign up to a convention apply the requirements of that convention to all ships, regardless of flag, whether the ship is um, flagged under a country that is a party to that same treaty or is not. And this effectively ensures uh, uh, level application of requirements once they enter into force. Also, um, during the course of discussions and, and development of the standards, Generally, IMO instruments strive to be consensus-based. Now, it's important to point out that there are um, provisions in the rules to allow for voting, and, and this is something that's often uh, referred to or um, referenced in um, coverage of, of certain discussions and decisions taken by the IMO. But the consensus-based decision-making is critically important for this level playing field concept, again, because with the, the greater amount of buy-in and the greater acceptance by all parties to that convention ultimately should lead to its universal application and ensure that it's applied in a fair and in a way that it was originally intended. Um, the last maybe aspect to consider about um, the work of the IMO in the sense of, let's say, environmental regulation, of course, is, is sort of speed of implementation or expectations on how quickly requirements and measures can be brought into force. Now, as it turns out, most of the IMO conventions utilize tacit amendment procedures in the articles of those conventions. Now, the idea here is to allow for expedited adoption of revisions to conventions to keep up with pace of technology change and avoid a lot of the um, diplomatic hurdles that would have to go into effect in order to update or adopt a new treaty regime. However, for the purposes of environmental frameworks, um, such as for air pollution measures under the Marple Convention, the tacit amendment procedures actually provide a, a convenient avenue to bring about changes relatively quickly. And I say relatively because, you know, again, even under the fastest, let's say, uh, uh, set of circumstances, me um, measures still have to be proposed, circulated for adoption, uh, a decision on the adoption taken, then there's an acceptance period and, an, and a period before entry into force, which is as a minimum 22 months. But these are important safeguards so that parties which are already signatory to a measure have the appropriate, I guess you could say, checks in place to ensure that nothing is, is sort of forced through that's um, you know, sort of undesirable. Now, um, as far as the timing as well, um, of course, the effects of the COVID pandemic uh, have been unprecedented. And the effects on the work of the IMO have been equally unprecedented. Uh, everything essentially stopped in March 2020. The program of meetings was suspended. And the council, the governing body of the IMO, had to develop um, sort of an approach to resume meetings by reconstructing the meeting schedule, prioritizing work that was critical to keep on track, and ensuring that basically all the T's are crossed and the I's are dotted to enable the work of the organization to continue. Um, 
much of the work is being done through virtual arrangements. There are, of course, considerable limitations with that, um, differences in time zones, ability to participate in platforms, but also the timing of the meetings themselves, which normally would be an all day endeavor are now really only limited to three hours because of limitations on simultaneous translation. Um, but effectively, I think the, the real limitation here is the inefficiency of virtual interactions, which I think we're all familiar with and experiencing. So one final point, I guess, to conclude is that, you know, again, going back to the consensus based decision making, even though it can be a time consuming process and for that reason, external pressures really shouldn't lead to the threat of regional initiatives due to impatience or frustration with this process. So I think what I'm trying to advocate for is that even though it can be a time consuming process, the consensus based decision making by the IMO is, is really critical to um, its long term success and long term having meaningful regulations develop as a result. So I think I'll stop there. I think I'm at my limit and I'll leave back over to you. Well, thank you, Nick. Um, quite interesting. As I briefly mentioned, that the um, uh, what the industry is trying to do to come up with um, input and trying to accommodate what's being what's being discussed at IMO is, is a huge challenge because we're only uh, well, we're theoretically a small industry, but a worldwide international industry. So we're dependent on stakeholders. We're very much dependent on the whole supply chain to um, to help in meeting these goals that IMO is trying to set. And so here today, um, uh, we have uh, Morten Shesmo from the um, uh, Cyril Lab, his co commercial lead, and he can uh, talk a little bit about what the other side or part of this supply chain is uh, doing. So Morten, I leave it to you. Thank you, Ole. Uh, yes, I'm the commercial and acting head of uh, Zero Lab in Klavnes. Uh, before this, I've been working a, a long history in the Klavnes group, uh, lastly responsible for our container fleet, which we have used uh, last year to sell out of. Uh, Klavnes has a 75-year-old history in shipping, and in the early days, we used to help uh, customers go from bags to belt, or from gear to gearless, or from small coasters to deep sea vessels. And in the last five years, we've also helped the same customers to go from analog to digital through our division called Clownless Digital. And last year, we also started Zero Lab to help uh, cargo owners start the process of converting their supply chains from brown to green. So uh, Zero Lab is not our sustainability department. It's rather organized as a startup with all the yellow stickers and design sprints and ideas that come with it, but with the bonus of having access to all our, our big customer groups. So we have given ourselves uh, this year to define exactly what our services or products should be. And we are now in multiple uh, customer dialogues with the buyers of transportation, the steel industry, the aluminum industry, the grain traders and all, all the likes on how we can make ourselves most useful to the industry. And uh, our initiatives fall broadly into two categories, uh, namely measuring of emissions and reduction of emissions. So up to now, uh, most uh, buyers of transportation have been focused on the emissions uh, from their own factories, the so-called scope of own emissions. And uh, with good reason, uh, that is where the main part of the emissions are naturally and also where it costs a lot for the industry to emit. So up to now the, uh, they have not spent a lot of time on understanding uh, the, the, the emissions from the shipments of raw materials to their factories. But this is about to change. Uh, most of our customers have to report scope 3 emissions to their shareholders now. Some of them have made corporate statements to reduce emissions by 2030 or be carbon free by 2050, for example. So they need to, to know where they start. And some of them have demanding customers who are asking them to document the footprint of the product they're selling, whether it's a ton of aluminum or steel or grain, for example. 
And further, uh, from 2023, shipping is included in the EU's ETS program, meaning that every ton of CO2 that is emitted in transporting goods into Europe or out of Europe has to be paid for. And a uh, carbon credit for a ton of CO2 costs today about 84 euros, more than double the price of uh, only a year ago. So shipping uh, emissions can no longer be disregarded. It's, a, it's a, an exposure with impact on the p &L and also the competitiveness of a company. So the first the service we have set up is uh, a, a monitor of emissions for cargo owners. It's a secure online solution where the cargo owner can monitor their CO2 emissions. They can see it per month or per trade lane or per commodity, and they can also use it to quantify how much the freight will go up once the EU ETS comes into play next year. We have the first uh, version of this out now, and we have some large global customers on it. And based on the feedback we are getting right now, I think this is a topic for most industrial players through 2022. And the other seg uh, initiatives uh, we are working on is related to reducing emissions. As we're all acutely aware, there are no zero emission vessels available, and it won't be for a long time still. So that doesn't mean that nothing can be done. Uh, and for now, we're working with our clients to improve their operational emissions. But simply, this is about upsizing, slowing down, taking control of port operations. Going from a handy size bulker to a supermax bulker, for example, can reduce emissions per ton carried by 25%. Reducing speed from 14 knots to 12 can uh, cut another 25%. And reducing waiting time in port can uh, save 10% of the total shipping emissions. And the good news is that these cuts come at a very low cost. Often they can be even NPV positive, depending on the investments needed to remove the bottlenecks and get control. Important also to mention that uh, in conjunction with uh, COP26, many governments signed the so-called Clyde Bank Declaration, uh, promising support for so-called green corridors. These are agreements between two or more governments and companies transporting goods between them to actively take early action on decarbonizing a specific shipping route. The first example that we have seen is an agreement made between Australia and Japan to decarbonize the iron ore route there. It has attracted a lot of attention from the from providers of green ammonia and hydrogen, from shipbuilders, from miners and steel producers in Japan. These have come together, joined forces to accelerate the development of carbon-free shipping there. And this is a good example. Uh, and we are now discussing with our customers whether we can gain similar interest for green corridors in other areas, for example, from Canada or Brazil to Europe or, or, uh, or even to, to Norway, where there are trade lanes with uh, rather large volumes and, and where governments on both sides have uh, signed the declaration. So that's a short intro to Zero Lab. We believe that uh, 2022 is a year where uh, our customers in the industry will switch gears from a compliance focus to a more considering uh, supply chain emissions a part of their competitiveness and start taking concrete steps to manage emissions. And we are trying to be with them on that journey. With that, I've set uh, the word back to you, Ole. Thank you, Morten, quite interesting. And um, I guess that really sets it up nicely for our next speaker uh, because uh, going in from 2022 and the the, the work in the pipeline to actually what alternatives are out there. It's uh, no one better than Jan Hagen Andersen, the business development director of DNV Maritime, uh, to uh, discuss a little bit about what they see in the pipeline available. Jan? 
Yes, uh, thank you, Ola, and, and thank to the organizer for um, putting up this conference. And as uh, mentioned, it would be nice to meet in person, but uh, this is certainly a, a good alternative, and I'll be happy to share um, some of the thoughts and experience from, from DNV on this uh, environmental challenge uh, moving forward. Um, I'll um, use a little um, um, slides here. Um, so I'll uh, try to share that uh, screen with you here, just to illustrate some of the points. Um, I think, as, as already mentioned, um, the decarbonization of shipping is, is definitely the, the great challenge of our time when it comes to the environmental impact of shipping. Um, and as I says, uh, because of the uh, regulation uh, announced at MAPC 76 and now also confirmed at 77, as well as a discussion as COP26, uh, this is uh, definitely one of the, the most uh, hot topics uh, these days. I think we can say that a lot of the previous energy transitions in shipping uh, has been relatively straightforward. Uh, which in, in comparison with the one confronts us today. Um, you know, in the past, vessels moved from wind uh, to, to coal, to steam, and finally oil with a sort of, with a focus on the, the financial benefits and, and just the, uh, the technology transition, uh, not so focused on the regulation. Uh, now, I think for sure that we see that the, uh, the drivers of this transition is very much uh, different uh, different uh, topics as well. Regulations is still a big driver, but also the financial uh, access to capital to drive this through the Poseidon principles, uh, but also the value chain requirements from charters, plus these uh, local and regional uh, challenges like the Fit for 55 in EU, the EU Green Deal, and as Martin mentioned as well, these green corridors. So there is a lot of drivers that are focusing uh, the industry uh, to drive this uh, challenge. So this makes the decision uh, much more complicated because First of all, the technology uh, to uh, reduce the emissions are still being developed, as well as the regulation and the trajectory of the regulations and the need for reducing the greenhouse gas emission from shipping is still uh, being uh, developed. So, so this compound, compound the difficulties of moving this forward. I think one way that DNV has tried to illustrate this is that as an owner or an operator, you got to identify the decarbonization stairway on how to meet this uh, demand and trajectory. And basically look at the carbon risk of your fleet and towards the future uh, of the future. Uh, so in the short term, uh, focus on the measures that are available, let's say on the EXXI regulation and what can be accomplished with the technology and uh, options available today. Uh, but then as we define the different trajectory in order to focus on the uh, reduction of carbon intensity for shipping, which is going to be the tool that the IMO and, and other stakeholders will use to uh, meet the requirements, uh, then as other technologies, and as we know more about the regulatory and financial incentives to meet this requirement, then to see when do I need to bring in other energy saving uh, measures, both technologically and, uh, and operational, whether these are energy saving devices, more efficient shipping, and then also the introduction of alternative fuels and other and other energy sources that will definitely needs to be developed in order to meet uh, those requirements. So, so this uh, sort of decarbonization de stairway, I think it, it's a way uh, to illustrate how this uh, is being, uh, can be looked upon. And we see that, you know, the, the owners that are already sort of focused on this, this process, and the first step is, as I said, you've got to assess, you've got to measure where you are, and then you've got to look at the options for the vessels in the short term, medium term, and long term in order to uh, meet the trajectory. 
So I think this is definitely um, the, the most important challenge to start looking at what is available there. So of course, we said this is a challenge. What is the opportunities? I think there's a number of opportunities as well for shaping. First of all, we see that there is a lot of collaboration ongoing, that the collaboration is the new fuel, is, is, a, is a, not only a catchphrase, but it's actually something that we see through the Maritime Technology Forum, forum like some of these uh, initiatives, like Morton mentioned, Zero Lab that companies are doing, as well as a lot of other initiatives and programs that DNV is involved in and a lot of other stakeholders are involved in. And, and we also see the growth of new companies, new people, new players into the maritime uh, industry that's actually making effort to change and innovate both on the technology side, but also on the way we do business and how we actually can you know, manage these changes that we need to do. I think the other issue that we also need to uh, uh, understand, and I think Ule, you also mentioned this, that you know the value proposition of shipping. I think this is a golden opportunity for us to um, let the public and the policymakers understand how important shipping is for the supply chain and our industry. And this is our opportunity to show that, yes, we take a proactive approach. We are not just focused on compliance or trying to be, low, be below the radar, but we're actually uh, you know, helping the industry and, and, and the public in order to uh, ensure uh, the financial well-being and sustainability of shipping as well. So I think this is really what I want to uh, say um, in this um, uh, forum and, and say and look forward to any questions that, that uh, our customers uh, and uh, listeners have. And um, I will um, close it out there and uh, hopefully um, look forward to uh, important discussions uh, through in the rest of this panel. So I'll uh, turn it over to you, Ulla. Thank you, Jan. Um, well, with that uh, decarbonization stairway, and uh, one of the biggest player in the world um, is, of course, the U.S. And uh, with the new uh, Biden administration, a lot of things are happening towards the green wave. And um, who's better to explain a little bit what's happening in the U.S. market and relating to um, um, elements like Jones Act and other factors uh, moving forward is uh, Charlie uh, Papavisas from partner in uh, Winston and Strawn uh, in Washington. So uh, Charlie, I leave the floor to you. Thank you, Ole. Uh, and thank you to the Hacknack organizers for inviting me. So I'm coming a little bit out of left field, given the topic of the panel in talking about offshore wind in the United States. But of course, that's one of the primary methods uh, the United States is employing to decarbonize its electricity generation. And you can't build an offshore wind farm without vessels. So what I'd like to talk about is a little bit about what's happening most recently. Uh, I'm assuming a lot of knowledge here of people uh, understanding what the offshore wind sector is like and how it's progressing around the world and just focus on the U.S. market. So recently, only less than two weeks ago, the uh, Biden administration announced its first major auction um, sale. Uh, this will occur on February 23rd. Uh, this is the area called the New York Bight. It's six uh, lease areas. It's almost 500,000 acres. Um, the, the, the strength of the market is going to show on that day. Uh, in other words, there, are, there is ongoing litigation about these wind farms challenges from fishermen and, and others. But if the money comes in big, it shows us that the developers um, have assessed those risks as being nominal risks and that these wind farms will be built. Uh, one of the most interesting things about this recent announcement is the first time that the federal government has announced local content requirements. Uh, states have announced local content requirements. Um, they have appeared in power purchase agreements and elsewhere. But now the federal government will incentivize local production, building monopiles, building turbines, blades, and so on in the United States will result in a reduction in the lease, the lease rate. Um, the, the Biden administration is also moving aggressively into other areas besides the Northeast of the United States. 
Uh, it issued recently an environmental assessment for the Gulf of Mexico, which a lot of people associate with oil and gas, but the Gulf of Mexico, especially uh, the Southern Texas area is almost an ideal place to produce offshore wind. Uh, the wind strengths are pretty decent and the water is very shallow. Um, and people are used to seeing things offshore and not complaining about it, which, whereas that is not always the case in Massachusetts and other places. So the, 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 the Biden administration also recently has issued its second approval for a wind farm. This is the South Fork, South Fork farm off of Rhode Island and uh, the eastern end of Long Island. Um, the first one was Vineyard. Uh, they say they're going to do 14 more approvals by 2025. Um, and that, of course, is pretty exciting. And in terms of another geographic area, there was also recent developments to move ahead with uh, uh, developing offshore wind, floating wind off central California. So just to talk a little bit about what this means in practice, um, we have uh, Nexens, which is the large French uh, submarine cable manufacturer and, and does other things as well. They have recently opened a facility in South Carolina, Goose Creek, $200 million facility. Orsted has recently announced plans to build a cable manufacturing facility in Baltimore with Hellenic Cable. Uh, EEW is building monopiles in New Jersey and so on. So on vessels, Dominion uh, Energy has announced a $500 million uh, wind turbine installation vessel. It's under construction already in Texas. Um, uh, Ole's sister company, Nede, is uh, talking about building WTIVs in the United States. They're already building a couple in South Korea um, and so on. The, 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 the area is definitely moving. Uh, it's very exciting. Uh, issues remain. Uh, there are definitely Jones Act issues unresolved. We're hoping to get some rulings soon um, that will help in that regard. Uh, there are definitely still unresolved tax issues, environmental issues. I'll just give you one, one example of how mundane this is going to become where the, off, um, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration uh, regulates how far away a vessel must be from an object before someone can jump over. And that distance does not really work in the offshore wind industry. It's a, it's a distance that's designed for other industries and it has to be changed. And that, that is just a microcosm of how many things have to happen to make this all come together. So with that, Ole, I, I'm just, as I said, this was just a pricey, a summary. Uh, the market is moving very fast. Uh, the vessel market's moving fast. The onshore market's moving fast. Developers are going to spend a ton of money. And there's a tremendous opportunity for the, uh, both the domestic and the foreign uh, maritime industry in this space. Thank you. Thank you, Charlie. And um, we will move into some uh, Q&A um, uh, Q session um, uh, following this. Well, thank you again. That uh, was an interesting debate um, and presentations, uh, many good viewpoints. Uh, I haven't received a lot of questions for the panel uh, for the final few minutes we have, but um, maybe one departing sort of thought, if anyone want to participate or give their opinion on one of the challenges many owners are faced with today is, you know, what do you go out and order today in order to work towards alternative fuels, emission-friendly ships. Um, how do we secure that all the stakeholders uh, move uh, forward in the same direction rather than individual, and then you get a fragmented market and it's not going to work? Uh, any thoughts from the panelists? Oli, can I go first, uh, just very briefly? I think, I think the offshore wind sector is almost an ideal lab for the two new technologies, the new fuels. Um, many of the vessels have to be newly constructed, especially the offshore maintenance uh, vessels, the CTVs, the OSVs. Second, you're talking about nearshore work by and large. So the vessels can take advantage of the battery technologies and other things earlier. And third, maybe the most important of all, the customer, the developers are very sensitive to having uh, as much of their supply chain uh, carbon free as possible. And so I think that the, the offshore wind sector may very well be the place where a lot of things get tested out. So that's my thought on that. Jan, do you see anything um, lining up as one direction than the other? 
I, I think it's going to be a little bit of a fragmented future. Uh, as I said, there is no one solution that fits all. Uh, so our advice and, and is, is really to look at uh, specific, specific trade or specific vessels that you know an owner is, is doing and, and try to find the solution that, that fits. I, I think there is definitely needed some collaboration and some clarity on on what solutions and and fuels that will be developed in the future but i, I think it's still going to be a mix of solutions but i i think based on the discussions we have uh, with the industry uh, i think everybody is pulling in the right directions but it is still going to take some um some discussions and clarifications in the future Morten, any thoughts from your side? Yes, obviously this uh, issue of uh, future fuels and vessels is a rather large and complex issue and kind of a chicken and egg discussion in many ways. And uh, I think this uh, green corridor concept that we discussed earlier is, uh, is a good way of reducing uncertainty for the, for the players. Uh, that is where the fuel providers, cargo owners, uh, port owners, and ship owners can come together and find a solution on a local scale and not on a global scale, and which then can be scaled uh, up uh, later. Uh, so I think that is probably a concept that can help us overcome this uh, in the short uh, to medium term. Nick? Uh, yeah. and. Thanks, because I think uh, you know, following on from the previous speakers is really, really helpful. Because again, from a regulatory perspective, obviously, I think you know, really engagement is is really the critical factor here, or or really a key to helping to to solve this issue. Um, as as Jan mentioned in the beginning of his presentation, this decarbonization of the industry is a significant challenge, and obviously the from a policymaker's perspective, standards need to be clear so that targets are unambiguous and that um, the industry can move forward in the right directions without necessarily becoming fragmented. Now, as far as a particular solution is concerned, um, obviously the measures for carbon intensity are, are were developed um, as, as goal-based measures. So it, you know, this was done to stimulate innovation. And, and so obviously it doesn't point to a, a single solution, or I think I tend to share the, the thinking that there probably isn't a silver bullet or a single singular type of a, a approach to this that uh, will eventually come out. But but the main thing is, again, to, to, to collaborate and to make sure that there's a, a clear foundation for this regulatory trajectory, and it works both ways. And industry obviously has a role in um, engaging with policymakers as well, just to um, principally to ensure that these lessons that are being learned in developing these new technologies are, are appropriately addressed um, from environmental performance as well as um, considering safety issues as well, and, and also making sure that the measures and the regulatory pathways are meaningful. And finally, we um, did get one question, um, and I'm not sure um, uh, who would be best to answer this, but how do we address the toxic nature of ammonia as a future fuel to ensure crew safety? Anyone? Well, maybe from perspective of uh, class, of course, this is uh, something we're working on through the, uh, the safety standard and risk assessment and making sure that uh, the safety of the crew and the operation, you know, with any any fuel or new technology that uh, will be uh, developed, that this is still going to be in the forefront of uh, the safe introduction of these fuels. And uh, we're uh, we're working uh, closely with uh, with all the stakeholders in order to ensure that we can introduce this new technology safely with minimal risk to the crew and uh, anybody else that is involved with it. But it is an important topic for sure. Okay, thank you so much to uh, to all of you for participating. Uh, very uh, uh, thought, thoughtful insight into our challenges we have uh, ahead of us. So uh, that wraps up my panel, and um, and again, thank you so much, and um, and back to the conference.